Good morning, everybody. So my name is Brian Cooper. First, see a little bit about my background here. Uh, oops, one second, just having a technical issue. Uh, I received my PhD in experimental condensed matter physics from Penn State University. After completing my doctoral studies, I was recruited to join the Intel Corporation at their primary R&D facility outside of Portland, Oregon, as a plasma edge engineer. And then I later transitioned to a frames engineer uh, for their experimental microprocessor platforms. Recently, after noticing how the lack of diversity in many STEM fields impacted many colleagues and friends of color, I decided to start my own business, Pal Cooper LLC, which is a company devoted to the goal of increasing the number of African Americans and other underrepresented minority groups in STEM based fields. So let me express my immense delight at having been asked to participate in this very much needed conference and a hearty thanks to all of the organizers and sponsoring institutions for all of their hard work in putting this program together. So let me introduce our speakers for today. Firstly, my friend Archie Dasgupta, or I should say Dr. Dasgupta. She earned her PhD in chemistry from Penn State University. And um, she, I will probably give them a couple minutes maybe to introduce themselves. So Archie, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. So hi, it's great to be here today talking to all of you. Uh, my name is Archie Dasgupta. As Brian mentioned, um, my educational background is in chemistry. Um, I did my PhD at the interface of chemistry and material science and engineering. And um, I um, focused on carbon nanotechnology, it's uh, sensing and adsorption applications during my PhD. After my PhD, I transitioned into Intel Corporation um, in, in, as a quality engineer, uh, working on defect reduction. So that's what I'm doing right now. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Dr. Dasgupta. And next we have Dr. Brian Kent Wallace, who is an assistant professor at Fisk University and the principal investigator of their rocket science program. Good morning, Dr. Wallace. Would you like to introduce yourself? Good morning. Thank you. It's a pleasure to meet you. Uh, yes, my name is Kent Wallace. I am from Fisk University. Uh, my background is my bachelor's and my master's are physics. Uh, bachelor's from Grambling State in Louisiana and master's from Fisk University itself. Uh, was hired by the university and later on complete, started a doctorate in astronomy, but actually ended in education because I, as I got more and more into the astronomy and just teaching at Fisk, I became more and more passionate about programs that would, just like this whole conference is about, getting more people of color into the area of math intensive sciences be it astronomy, engineering, or what have you. So that is uh, kind of my bag. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, sir. And lastly on our panel today, we have Dr. Christopher Lee, also a friend of mine from Penn State. Dr. Lee uh, finished his PhD in chemical engineering, and I'm gonna let him introduce himself now. Good morning, thanks for the introduction. Um, so I did my undergrad in agriculture engineering, actually. Um, at UC Davis and decided to do my PhD um, due to my interest in research. And so in my presentation, I'll be talking a lot about um, graduate, my graduate research and my thesis topics, um, which had to do with ultra fast nonlinear optics. So you get a lot of physics in there, but the applications were for biologists. So there's also a lot of, you know, meaningful connections to how engineering and how physics um, really assists um, the questions that a lot of um, life science researchers are asking. Um, so that's what my, my uh, talk will be on. Um, after I graduated from Penn State, um, I got um, a position at Intel as well. So I'm also located uh, right now in Oregon. Um, and currently I am transitioning to a degree in nursing. Um, I left Intel about two years ago and I'm working with a um, company right now, a nonprofit, um, but those are Lutheran communities and they work with people with intellectual disabilities. So advocacy um, is something that I, I really have um, gotten into in the last couple of years and it's really important to me, but also science and technology. So um, I hope that um, what I say is, um, what I present is meaningful and helpful and um, I'm really glad to be here. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. So first on our agenda is Dr. Archie Dasgupta, who is going to be our speaker today. She is a defect metrology engineer at Intel Corporation. 
taken on Dr. Dasgupta? All right. Um, so if I can have my presentation on, um, let me see. Oh, your presentation. There you go. Okay. Great. All right. So I actually want to talk about my personal journey in uh, STEM career, especially as a woman. And um, to begin with, I think I want to share a few um, um, traits that I thought is really important to succeed in STEM career, especially for minorities and women. These are really important because the society and the culture is not necessarily tilted in our favor a lot of times. So um, there are a few things that I think personally has helped me. And hopefully if I share those, it might be helpful for all of us. So if I go to my first slide, Yeah, so the first thing I want to talk about is, I think it's very important um, to know what you want to do. Um, it, it sounds kind of obvious, but at the same time, um, we have to think independently from any type of expectation or you know, societal pressure or anything. Uh, we need to really find, which helped me um, a lot from my childhood, is that I was curious about science and I wanted to do science, but also I was very specific at every point that what really interests me and if I think something is interesting, what are my uh, best traits, like what am I good at and um, what are the things I really like to do. So it, it helps us during our educational career, but I think it helps us even well into our professional career. Um, at every point, you have to be your authentic self. So with that, um, once you figure out what you want to do, what, what are the things that interest you the most, I think the next important thing will be um, finding mentors or role models. So if you go to the next slide. So when I was in my uh, middle school, um, we were given a project to um, talk about the scientists that interest us. And I still remember, I actually um, make an, made an effort that time and I focused on female scientists and not because back then um, I knew what is the importance of that, but I was just genuinely curious. When I was growing up, I didn't see any representation of women in science um, as we are seeing a little bit more today. But back then I didn't see that. But when I did my own research, even with all this underrepresentation, I was able to find um, women and women of color who did excellent work. And it was just their stories were not shared with us. So I think it's really important sometimes to go back and look in the history. Um, that really helped me as a child. And um, I was very lucky in my high school, I had um, both my math and um, chemistry teachers, they were both female and they were brilliant. And um, I think um, that short sort of um, shaped my future. And um, finding a mentor, I think is very important, especially for minorities at every stage because uh, they can help us navigate through some difficult situations because they have already gone through them. And as we move um, more higher into our careers, um, it might be harder to find mentors, but I personally, um, for example, when I joined my professional career at Intel, um, I, I made an effort myself to find uh, some female mentors. And from the beginning of my uh, Intel career, they have been really helping me. And I think to find those connections is really important and um, uh, it will really help in future um, career in science. So if we go to the next slide. Yeah, so the other thing I, I really wanted to talk about, especially uh, for the woman here, um, I think um, another important thing is um, to have um, peer support. Um, as you can see in this picture, there are a lot of women in science and I met them during my um, grad school and some of them are, um, now in industry, some of them are now in um, 
assistant professors or postdocs in uh, in universities. So um, to have a supportive group of uh, not just friends, but even in terms of professional collaboration with um, people of your communities, that sort of engagement really helped me uh, move through uh, my um, uh, graduate school and also even today. So that's something I think, um, especially I think for women that would be very important because um, even today I think women face a lot of challenge regarding self-doubt, regarding confidence. So we can really help lifting each other up. And if we go to the next slide. Yeah, so another point I wanted to talk about is uh, to be aware of your environment. As we, um, as we see in this picture, that's more or less uh, the, the, like a snapshot from work unfortunately in many places. Um, at high tech industry, I think there are only 20% or less than 20% women engineers and um, very few minorities as well. So if you are in an environment where you feel um, you were facing additional challenges um, as, or you know, the culture is exclusive uh, uh, or you, you feel like you are having an inflexible environment, I think you should be aware. Uh, it has happened to me in the past and um, right now at, um, at my work, I have an excellent manager, but that was not the journey when I started. Um, the group I joined initially, I didn't feel I was very much included in, in that environment. It was a very um, bro culture driven environment. So um, we know it as minorities or as women when that happens and we just need to keep an open mind um, and um, just know that uh, there are people who are also very passionate about truly integrated diversity, not just for the sake of you know, statistics. So there are pe people who, who will be helping us. And so it's important to identify that type of people and um, make a network really and if you face any problem you can just go and um, connect with them and um, try to make the situation work for you in a better way. So with that said I will go a little bit on my uh, career in um, uh, as I said before uh, I worked in the interface of chemistry and material science engineering. So my purpose um, I will go to the next slide so uh, when I um, when I was in high school, my interest um, in chemistry was because uh, I wanted to use um, changes in materials to solve some real life problems. And in my graduate school, I got the opportunity. I want to talk about one of the projects very quickly that I worked on. So here in the screen, you can see I'm showing um, an organic contaminant in water. Um, this, uh, this is a molecule called nit nitrobenzene. It's, um, it's pretty well used in the chemical industry because it, um, it's used to produce anilin and anilin is used to produce um, polyurethane, which you can find in any hard plastic like tire or uh, pipe, things like that. So it's a very well used material, but the problem is because of the, um, you know, to group present in this molecule, it has, um, pretty high polarity and um, it is well absorbed in water. So once it gets absorbed in water, it has, um, it also has higher density than water. So it tends to go um, under the surface, which makes it harder to clean up. Um, and once it enters to, to our body, uh, it interacts with hemoglobin and um, it has pretty adverse um, effect on our body. Um, in 2005, um, there was a spill of this nitrobenzene, um, like 100 ton, um, in a river in China. And um, the only defense we had was to use um, activated carbon. And I think it, um, in that case, it, we had to use like um, 1,000 ton or something like a really large um, quantity of, uh, of um, usual carbon material. So when I started my research, I wanted to um, look at 
new carbon materials um, using nanotechnology so that we can solve this kind of problems we can have um, instead of standard um, carbon if we can make some structure which has a better absorption which can help us clean this kind of spills or even as a filter at your home um, for uh, water purification right now most of the filters that are available we use um, just porous carbon so in the next slide um, yeah so um, so I used um, graphene based materials um, in my uh, PhD which is basically a hexagonal sheet of carbon um, uh, which is which has very high porosity uh, a high um, surface area but um, there are a few challenges to make this uh, this type of material uh, the picture here uh, the, on the left side it's a model that will be like an ideal um, absorbent which will utilize uh, the high surface area of graphene sheet but also will it utilize some porosity some sort of edge interaction so all this goodness if we can combine all of them together uh, we can design a superior absorbent which is better than current activated carbon so um, in the next slide um, so um, for this project when I, I began this work, um, I, I used a material called carbon black, which is a commercial material. And um, we synthesized uh, something that we call uh, graphitic nano ribbons, which are one dimensional structures of um, um, graphene sheets, um, but they have a very high uh, aspect ratio. So um, both of these materials are pretty similar in terms of uh, surface area, but um, I wanted to know if this can be a better absorbent, for example. But uh, we had this challenge that this kind of graphitic nano ribbon is super hydrophobic. They have a lot of goodness, but we can't dissolve them in water. And if we dissolve them in water, um, uh, we use such high concentration of acid, uh, which is not environment friendly and which doesn't really um, give you a material which retains the, the um, high interactions, uh, the, basically the, um, all the dispersive forces that will actually help the absorption. So I came up with a, um, a technique with uh, peroxide and UV light to have a very mild oxidation. Um, and um, here I'm just showing um, in one of these um, uh, graphs where it shows that the zeta potential of this material that I um, made was around five, that means it's, it's pretty mild because the pH of water is seven. So it can be well dissolved in water uh, and um, also be used as an, as an absorbent. And turns out that it was a better absorbent. It was almost twice uh, improved compared to its um, commercial equivalent carbon black. So, but both of these materials, they are, these are pretty low surface area. So that's, that's not really going to solve a big problem. So if we go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so um, I think the final um, piece of this puzzle that we had, um, I created another material um, which is more close to graphene, but of course graphene is a um, is not a bulk material, it's just one sheet of, uh, um, of carbon. In this case, I, I, I made a material that is sort of a hybrid um, activated carbon and graphene. We made this uh, with um, our colleagues with a rice husk, which is a waste material, as you know. And so we thought if we can use a waste material and, uh, and use it for cleaning up uh, the environment, that's actually probably the best use of it. And we were able to make this material. Um, as you can see below, it's a very thin material, very, it had a lot of nano sized domains. It had really tiny pores that can uh, absorb something which is as small as like nitrobenzene is a really small molecule. It's like um, six angstrom size. So, um, so with this kind of corrugated structure with nano sized domain, we, we, we really got closer to finding a better absorbent. Um, and if we go to the next slide, that's 
I think my final conclusion from this. So I compared this to uh, two um, commercially available activated carbons, which are used today for, for um, chemical spill cleanup. One was um, from Mark, which is pretty uh, standard as a material, and one was uh, pure carbon. It's a Latin American um, carbon material. And um, it turns out the, the, the material that we synthesized in our lab, it was pretty high in terms of porosity um, compared to this, especially at, at low concentration, that's really helpful. So um, I'm not showing it here, but we did a lot of analysis to understand the actual mechanism of, of how this, um, how the pores interact and how, how, how it really helps the material. And we came up with the fact that um, when we have a low concentration, like a general um, um, water, um, not a big chemical spill, but a everyday water, um, this, this kind of pore size mass matching is really important. And when it goes more to a high concentration uh, regime, the accessibility becomes more important. And we, we did some fine tuning and um, uh, the material finally came out to be a pretty high saturation absorption capacity uh, material. And we can extend this, of course, with other, some other similar um, carbons, which are not too, uh, there, there is a little bit difference in their dispersive interactions, but not too dissimilar from this. So um, I think I this is just one of the projects that I worked on and I wanted to give an example, um, what kind of problems we try to solve as chemists or as uh, material science engineers. Um, so with that, I will conclude my talk. And uh, I have a thank you slide for all my mentors throughout my um, career in uh, research. So with that, if you have any questions, you can let me know. So thanks. Well, thank you, Dr. Dasgupta. Uh, you know, I think we're going to take the questions and answers at the end of the session. So I'm just going to keep the session moving. So, Dr. Wallace. Hello. So I have uh, been asked to provide a kind of physics is fun, the, shall we say, the more exciting side of physics, because we sometimes think the math intensive sciences, um, the, more, the, the math intensive sciences are dissuade people from uh, participating. So I put together a video uh, because it would be easier to do some demonstrations and record it rather than um, simply uh, do them right out. So I will ask, um, I will ask the uh, representative to just go ahead and start the video. I think there's a problem with the volume. Okay, so I'm gonna ask, uh, the sound's not coming through. So what I will do is I will tell you what I was saying and you'll just see it if they can try to get that sound going, but we'll keep it marching. So what, we're t what I'm talking about here is the sun and it's an interesting thing about the universe that we live in. It's so incredibly vast. And that's the part that makes it so exciting. So, oh, they stopped it? Okay. I think they're going to start it again. Well, I'll, I'll prepare you while that uh, video is getting uh, made. Uh, I want you to think about something for a second. This Earth is really, really big. And, but now big is a relative term. And so, you know, you could be walking around and for days and not leave a state. On the beach. Here we go. Hello, 
My name is Dr. Brian Kent Wallace, Assistant Professor of Physics at Fisk University. And this is It's Not Amazing, It's Physics. Let me ask you, do you ever know why you get cold or maybe that you're hot? Not from a physiological standpoint, but from a physics standpoint. What's the mechanism of why you're hot or cold? Did you know that every time you look up in the sky, you're looking into the past? Or did you ever wonder what is it that keeps a bike up when the wheel is turning, but it won't stay up if it's standing still? We're going to take a look at a few of those things on this session of It's Not Amazing, It's Physics. So remember when I said that every time you look up the sky, you're looking into the past? Take a look here. This is the Whirlpool Galaxy. It's 23 million light years away, which means the Whirlpool Galaxy that you're looking at right now is actually 23 million years old. If you wanted to know what that galaxy looks like at this second, you'd have to wait 23 million years for the light to leave that galaxy to get to your eye. Let's think about that for a second. That means that every galaxy and every star that you see is from the past because the closest galaxy to the Earth is about 4.6 light years away. So even the closest star to us is four years old. Well, technically, the closest star to us is 8.22 minutes old. Or should I say 8.2 minutes away. So let's look at another star, the closest star to us, the sun. The sun is 119 million kilometers away. Now, how far is that? Well, if light travels 186,000 miles a second, it takes light 8.2 minutes to get from it to your eye. That means if the sun blew up right now, boom, you wouldn't know about it for 8.2 minutes. <laughs> so at least you have 8.2 minutes to get all your affairs in order with every spiritual being that you pray to. And if not, you know, at least say goodbye to a few people. But it gives you a really good idea of just how vast the universe is. Now here's a really interesting physics principle. We don't know exactly why a gyroscope works, we just know that it does. A gyroscope is nothing more than a rotating wheel. So let's take a look at what happens when I spin this wheel. If you notice, it's on my finger and I can balance it without holding it. We know it has an angular momentum because it rotates, but we're still trying to figure out what are the forces that keep it up. So what if I told you you have a little bit of a misconception about what happens when you go out on hot and cold days? You see, we think that we go out on a cold day, we're going out into something, into the cold. But when you really think about it, what is heat and what is cold, when you go out on a hot day, you're going out into thermal energy. When you go out on a cold day, you're actually going out into an absence of energy. So you're actually going out into nothing or a less than something. I'll explain. Why do you feel heat on a hot day? Well, because of the thermal energy in the air, the particles that are flying around, billions and trillions of atoms are moving and they have kinetic energy. And that particle slams into your skin and it's converting kinetic energy into thermal energy. When you're out in the cold, there's not as much thermal energy in the atmosphere, so the particles don't move as fast. So they don't translate as much kinetic energy into thermal energy, so much to the fact that you feel cold. So the cold isn't a thing. The cold is really the absence of a thing. I'll give you a demonstration of how it works. What if I said I could burn through paper without the need of a laser or a fire or anything like that. All I need is the energy communicated in my two hands. In fact, let's do a quick demonstration. I'm going to ask you to clap your hands as hot as you can on the count of three. One, two, three. Did it sting? 
If it didn't, you didn't do it hard enough. One more time, as hard as you can. One, two, three. Yeah. Feel that little burn? Sure. Burn is actually the kinetic energy, which is one half mb squared, the mass of your hands divided by two times the velocity squared of your hands coming together. That kinetic energy was converted into thermal energy, which is mc, or specific heat of your skin. C is the specific heat, m is the mass of your hands, and delta t is the change in temperature. So the kinetic energy was converted to uh, thermal energy, and the temperature change was the burning that you felt. In fact, if you did that as hard as you could for an hour, you'd start to develop blisters. Those come from second and third degree burns. So we'll demonstrate that effect right here. What I have are two heavy masses, and what we'll do is we'll let them interface at this paper, and then you'll zoom in and you will see that I will burn through the paper by converting kinetic energy into thermal. Are you ready? Three, two, one. There you have it. As you can see, a hole was burned right through the paper after converting the kinetic energy of the balls into the thermal energy that was so hot it could burn through paper. This is basically what's happening when the particles of the air are colliding with your skin. The thermal, the, on a hotter day, they're more energized, so they're moving faster. So billions upon trillions of collisions are making you feel hot. But on cold days, the particles are not as energized, so not as much energy is being converted to thermal, which is why you feel cold. <laughs> Maybe you've looked at some building construction and you wonder, how did they make that? How is it even standing? It, might, it looks like it's out of balance or it's gonna fall over. Let me show you an, a little engineering trick. Well, it's not even an engineering trick, it's just physics. You see, the center of gravity of an object is located in its middle. So if you have these four blocks, the center of gravity is right here, in between the bottom two and the top two and in between the two ends. But I can actually do this so that they make a step ladder out like this, except what'll be interesting is I'll be able to make the top block actually so far out, it's past the perimeter of the platform or the, platform or the chair that it's sitting on. Watch. All we have to do is move the center of gravity. So if the center of gravity is in the center right here, and then I move this block out, the center of gravity is at the same height, but it's moved over. So as long as I can get the center of gravity just to the edge of the center of gravity of the whole system, just to the edge of the chair, this will actually be in balance. So as you can see, the way we arranged the four blocks, we manipulated the center of gravity of the system so that the last block is actually over the edge of the table itself, as though it's hanging out there without it actually falling out of balance. Again, the trick is, every time you move a block, out, a block out, the center of gravity moves a little bit forward. So as long as the center of gravity of the entire system is, is within the edge of the platform, the system doesn't come out of balance. So what we have here is the ring thrower demonstration. You see, we can take this projectile and get it to fly. How? By using magnetic force. See, what we'll do is we'll start a current running through this coil, which will induce a magnetic field around the coil. That magnetic field will actually induce a current running around this ring. But because there's a current running around the ring, it will induce a magnetic field in the opposite direction. The two magnetic fields will be opposed to each other, which will cause a force to make the ring fly. It's not anything you may not have felt before, like if you took two um, for refrigerator magnets and put the same poles next to each other, that resisting force. Well, that is the same force that's gonna make this fly. So let's take a look. Three, two, one. <laughs> it's not amazing, it's just physics.
So for you future scientists out there, hopefully it's just to show that there's an aspect of science that is actually just plain old interesting. And even as you get more and more into it and the concepts get more and more complex, sure, the intellectual capacity, you know, you're, 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 you're exercising your abilities intellectually, but it's your interest that keeps you going. And so I hope for those of you, this was an enjoyable opportunity to see how physics is not just amazing. Or should I say, it's not amazing, it's just physics, and it's fun. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wallace. So, uh, we are running quite a bit early, so I'm just going to go to see if there's any questions from anyone before we move on to Dr. Lee. I'll give you a couple seconds, anyone? Okay. Well, Dr. Lee? I'll, I, I will oh. ask one question. Oh. Dr. Wallace. Uh, thank you, uh, because there, I see a couple of my students uh, that are in the room that had uh, kind of their uh, first research experiences in the summer. And so uh, Dr. Desgupta, I, that, that, that feeling that you felt about being that only one in the room, and also that the thing that we seldomly talk about openly, but that, that intrinsic imposter syndrome and trying to cope with it, um, I just would be happy if you, you know, said for the students, you know, what were your coping mechanisms? Did you have people to vent to? Was it your intrinsic grit? What was it like coping with those kind of inner demons, if you will? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I think we all deal with it, whether we admit it or not. Um, I, what I did um, in particular is to find similar people. So I think that's, that really helped me. Like for example, when Brian was, uh, he, he's my, he was my co mentor and when he was there and I had a few other friends who all sort of went through similar experiences and we will have discussions during lunch and you know, what we're doing and we sort of try to lift each other or we will, um, if we have any uh, difficult situation, we, we always accept it at the beginning because sometimes when we talk to that with other colleagues who don't have similar experience, um, what I felt is that um, sometimes it's not very obvious and those are very subtle things. So um, if people don't have the same experience, sometimes they don't get it. So. Um, for me, it was always um, discussing with people who, who have been through the same things, especially with um, more experienced people, because I have talked to some um, women who are already in leadership positions, and they, they have helped too, because they have all, all, all been there, basically. Excellent. Thanks for sharing that. Thank you, Dr. Desgupta. So we are still running a little bit ahead of schedule, but uh, so if there are any other questions before we move on, otherwise I'll turn it over to Dr. Lee. Anyone? I, I have a question. Certainly. I don't understand the center of gravity experiment you did in the video. I don't understand why those blocks didn't fall over. Could you explain that one more time? Sure. Um, here's the really easy way of doing this, uh, or, or way of explaining it. So, if I balance this on my hand, the center line of the tape, it, it, the center of gravity would be halfway up, if we assume that this is a symmetrical system, and it would be down the center line, right? Now, I can tilt my hand ever so slightly, and this doesn't fall over. As long as the center of gravity of this object stays within the perimeter of its base, it will always stay balanced. I could tilt it over, it'll come back. But if that center of gravity falls outside the base, it falls over. 
So with the blocks, if you think of all the blocks as a system, the center of gravity is in the, you know, halfway up and right down the middle. But if I slide a block over, then the center of gravity of the entire system moves over. But it'll stay in balance as long as that center of gravity is when the, within the base of the block that's on the ground, on the, you know, on the platform. Mm -hmm. So the trick is just basically slide the blocks over, change the center of gravity. Now remember, the block you move can fall out of balance of the block that's just under it. So you're really managing two sets of center of gravities. The center of gravity of the individual block that you're moving, and then accounting for the center of gravity of the system of blocks. So as long as each block is center of gravity is within the base of the block below it, and then the collective center of gravity is within the base of the bottom block, it doesn't fall over. Does that help? Yes, sir. That makes sense. I also just want to say thank you so much to everyone who presented today. And I have to take my leave because I have a calculus two midterm at 10 o'clock. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for coming, Daniel. Okay, so you know what, at this point in time, we're a little bit closer to where we are in our scheduled time. I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Dr. Lee. Dr. Lee, please. Okay, um, I think I need to share my screen, if possible. Okay, can everybody, can you see that? Okay. So thank you very much for having me. I'm really excited um, to talk to you a little bit about my research that I did when I was in graduate school. Um, and this was at Penn State. So here's a picture of my lab group. Um, and I really liked what uh, Dr. Dasgupta talked about, mentorship. Um, when I look back on my years in graduate school, I think a lot about my um, lab group sort of as a small family. Um, and in this image here, I'm showing the people I worked most closely with, um, Kabi, who now um, works at Intel and lives in Oregon, and same thing with Ala. And these are two international students I worked very closely with um, in my research. And so we sort of all helped each other. Um, Ala worked a lot on um, diamond light carbon, so she helped me a lot with the optical profilometry research, and I helped her. Um, by doing some spectroscopy and Kabi worked a lot on the biological sample preparations. So I'll show you um, the pictures I'm showing on the following slides um, come from them actually. So um, kind of connecting it to what um, Dr. Desgupta was saying, um, I really enjoyed graduate school because um, it was really meaningful to have people that cared a lot about the science foremost. And I really believe that, and I want to encourage all of you guys, if you are interested in science, and specifically in graduate school, um, finding a close-knit group of people that um, have a passion for science is really essential. And um, getting those people into the programs and into the labs where their ideas are um, collaborative and they come out with novel research is really, it's really exciting. Um, for me to, that I experienced in um, in my years at Penn State. And so I think that's it's really awesome to see um, the consortium for minority students um, and what you guys are all trying to achieve. Um, and so the other um, people involved here are undergraduates. And so every year we would have um, different universities and um, the graduate students would work with undergrads from all over the country. And so um, our lab did this several years in a row. And so a lot of the work um, was with the efforts from undergraduates as well. And so I do know that um, Penn State does partner with other universities. And so to check out the opportunities with your university would be a great starting point to see if you're interested in, in research at the um, graduate student level. Okay. so. I showed a, I'm showing a picture up here. I'm not sure if you can see my uh, mouse cursor, but in the upper right hand corner, this is actually a picture I took for my cell phone. Um, I did a lot of um, laser spectroscopy. So, um, and this was funded by the Department of Energy um, at Penn State. And um, in this picture, I'm showing basically uh, a plant sample. This is actually a, a glass slide containing cotton on it. And I'm shooting 
um, infrared and visible uh, laser beams at it. You can't see the infrared because it's a, you know, it's the optical camera on the cell phone doesn't capture the infrared, but you can see the huge scattering of the visible photons off of the, off of the cotton slide here. And what we're really interested in and what we were funded to produce was a machine that allowed us to detect a very special signal and these is it's abbreviated sfg so this is basically you're combining the frequencies of your two inputs and so i'll go into a little bit detail later about why sfg is important and why this is something that was that was funded so heavily but basically here on the left hand side you can see this is the the whiteboard, you know, drawing schematics of how we're going to put this together and what we actually needed to achieve this. So you guys, um, if you have introductory um, physics, you know that power is the, um, the input of energy um, divided by the time period. So what we use is a pulse laser system. So um, this is femtosecond, so this is 10 to the negative 15. That's how short the uh, laser pulses last for. So these pulses don't last for very long at all. And what happens is you get very high power. So at very high power combining these two laser beams, you get very special signals. So on the next slide, I'm going to show you a little bit about how we achieved the visible signal. And here on the left, you can see the laser source. So this is um, the, the um, ND uh, um, YLF um, 520, 527 nanometer laser source. This is the pulse train here shown on the right. And sort of here up at the top, you can see optical parametric generation. So this is how we get the visible beam. And this is the profile that you're looking for. So by adjusting the optics and um, the, the dispersion, so we have a couple gradings over here, we can control the visible light source that we need for our experiments. Um, and now going to the infrared laser source, um, this picture was actually taken by Ala and Kabi one, one day in which we were no longer getting any signal at all. We opened up the box to find that there, you can see that on the left hand side, there's a crack right down the middle. And so this crystal, this orange crystal produces the infrared beam and it splits the light into um, different components we filter out and use the infrared. And so you can see that we had to remove, replace, and repair it. Um, this crystal actually ends up costing $10,000. So um, it was quite an experience, a delicate experience to make sure you don't mess this up and you get everything correctly. So this is um, something I took away also from graduate school is how to work on the machines, how to work on the lasers and how to produce different uh, frequencies of light. All right, so on the left hand side here on this picture, this is actually the housing that the laser rod um, sits in and you can see these tubings here. This is the cooling system. So it's cooled by water that's flowed through the housing and that's how, you know, the, um, the it's maintained thermally and you get a steady um, input of, of light. On the right hand side here, you can see um, this is actually a business card. Um, and if you remember from introductory physics, if you guys have taken that yet, the uh, conservation of momentum. So we have on the right hand side here, the inputs of the infrared, that's a guiding laser. Um, so it looks red, but you can't see infrared. And then the visible light here a little bit lower and you basically get out a protractor, you measure the angle, and this is where you predict that your outgoing photon will be if you set a sample right here at the, at the intersection. And so this is really important because the signal beam is so faint that you're not able to see it. It's technically blue, but it's not able, you're not able to visually see with your eyes. So this is um, connecting what you learn in the introductory physics and how you can use that in the experiment. Um, this is, a picture of the cubicle that all um, of my lab groups and I shared. And so I wanted to say a little bit about research and that it's a lot of reading. So if you love reading and you really like digging into um, the topics about what is known in your field, um, this is something that um, I really enjoyed about it. And it, it's um, a lot of the individual work is a lot of reading, but the collaborative work in the lab um, is a group effort. All right. So who, who actually cares about building something, um, something like this? So I mentioned some frequency generation, but why is this even important or who would even want to use something like this? 
And so this is where we bring in the plant biologists. So um, the DOE grant to make this SFG spectrometer was actually um, thought of by my mentor and it was something that he had a conversation with the plant biologist who as you can see here there in the two images of the plants um, there's the wild type so this is what is actually grown this is about a foot tall and this is a mutant and you can see when they section off or cut across one of the stems you can see this is all different types of cells and you can see they're stained um, the walls of the cells are stained so the some cells are function for transport and others for defense or um, for, for uh, structure. And you can see that when some of the genes are mutated, that the, the, integ the integrity of the walls are now changed. And so this affects how the plant is able to grow. And so one of the things that the plant bi biologist really wants to understand is how do we get information about why this is happening? And so this is where the lasers that I showed you in the physics really comes in. So I want to take a look a little bit about, let's, let's zoom in a little bit even further where this black arrow is about the, um, the thickness of this. And let's take a look about what's inside. So in plants, um, plants the, the cell walls specifically, they're made of a bunch of, a bunch of sugars. But the component, the sugars, they have different structural properties. And on the left here, um, I'm showing orange rods. So these are cellulose and they're crystalline, meaning that they have structural order. And then they're combined with other types of sugars, which are amorphous or they're more um, gel-like or, you know, they don't have a defined structure over a, link, a defined length scale. And together, this is what makes the integrity of the cell wall. And when it, it's working properly, you have something that is able to withstand predators and uh, pathogens, it's able to grow um, tall, and it's able to transport nutrients properly. But when this is not happening, um, that integrity is compromised. On this next slide, it looks a little bit busy, but basically what I wanna get here is that um, I showed you a little bit about SFG, and it's not the only technique. So there's many, many different types of techniques you can use. And, all, and by using these techniques together, we can come out with a complete picture about what's happening. It's kind of like if you were to go into you know, the urgent care, they might run you know, blood work or uh, x-rays or MRIs or CT scans to get an overall picture about what's happening inside. And so SFG, the, the techniques that we made in our lab group, was something that worked together with a bunch of other techniques as well. And those techniques are x-ray diffraction, um, um, density functional theory, so this is a quantum mechanical calculations, um, atomic force microscopy, it gives you surface information, and also SEM, scanning electron microscopy, you can see the cross section of cotton fibers. And so by using SFG with all the other techniques, we can come out with a complete picture. All right, so to understand the plant cell wall, its growth, where are we going with this? So you probably heard about uh, biomaterials or biofuels. So one of the things that we wanted to do is if we can understand how the plant grows um, and what's happening on the inside, then we can more deeply understand how to engineer and deconstruct those cell walls in order to make materials. Um, like Archie was showing with her um, um, husk materials and na uh, nanomaterials. Um, so this is actually really important to, for the biologist to understand how the plant grows. That information comes back to engineers to understand how we can take it apart, make fuels or materials which are economically beneficial and useful. So going back a little bit to the laser. So I mentioned a little bit about how cell walls are um, amorphous or they don't have defined structure. And in this situation, there isn't any SFG photon produced. So we can see the signal here on the right is 0, 0. 0.000. It's very close to baseline and there's no features. It's, it's basically noise. But when you have something like cellulose that's crystalline, it's ordered, you can see I've shown arrows over here. If the, your structure is ordered over you know, a large length scale, you're producing this blue light, this SFG light, and you get these peaks here. And I'm gonna go show a little bit of what this, these peaks mean, but the main point here is that when you have a plant material that's under our system, the information you're getting is from the cellulose and it excludes the rest. 
All right. Okay. So this is a video um, showing the structure of cellulose. So this is um, the gray bars here are showing the carbon molecule. So this is one glucan uh, ring and you have oxygen in red and hydrogen in white. And you can see the oxygen hydrogen bonds here, they're on equatorial position. So they're sort of on the equators of these rings. These rings are all linked together in chains and the blue shows the hydrogen bonding between the chains. So hydrogen bonding allows these chains to be flat. You can see the carbon hydrogen bonds have van der Waals interactions allowing them to stack and to hold in the, in the sheets are stacked on top of one another in the plants. So this is an example of a cellulose, um, they call them microfibers. They're really a nanometer length scale though. So this is about um, three to five nanometers in things like wood. And these extend um, hundreds of nanometers long. So when we talk about cellulose, this is the ordering that we're talking about. It's, it's in, a, in a crystal structure. All right, so what we did, um, and this is an animation here, I'm not sure if you can see it, but when I showed the peaks here, what is the information we're getting? So the information that we're getting um, are the vibrational motions of the molecules. So we can see that we're getting carbon hydrogen, the, um, um, so in this case, this is the oxygen hydrogen stretching vibrations over here, the smaller peak shown in red. Uh, next slide. This is the another oxygen hydrogen stretching vibration. Um, here we go. This is uh, this one can't be shown, but this is the the CH stretching vibration. Oh, okay. I'm running out of time here. So this and so the, basically the structural information here comes from the vibrations of the molecules themselves. And I'll skip through a lot of the additional information. Okay. All right, let's go to one example of how this is meaningful and useful. Okay. Okay. So this is one example of what we worked with the plant biologist. So we took a, um, a growing plant and we sectioned it into different parts. So we basically cut it up uh, different um, lengths along the stem. And what we found was the cellulose concentration was higher at the bottom because it needs to support the weight of the plant. And it's constantly growing from the bottom up. And so more cellulose is ordered, not only at the bottom, but there's more of it. And as you move towards the top, you can see that that concentration decreases. But when the plants are mature, this is, um, this is showing the different spectra from the, the laser when the plant is mature, that cellulose is at a similar concentration and similar ordering throughout the length of the plant. And this is done on the intact plant. Um, the other um, economical importance is cotton. So, what people are really interested in is the mechanical strength of cotton fibers and also their diability. And so this is related to the cellulose within the walls. So I'm showing here as the cotton um, seed grows and the cellulose is produced inside the fiber, we can see here that our SFG spectra, the peaks of the, of the cellulose within those walls, not only increases, but we have a difference in species. So here we showed on the left is Egyptian cotton versus the standard Hashushim cotton that they, um, that is that is more conventionally used. And so this is one giving second. Us I'm sorry to interrupt you, Doctor. Yeah. Just we, we're running out of time. We have okay. approximately a little under a minute before we need to actually start our question and answer section. So I would ask you if you could just maybe summarize. Right. So this is this is um, the end of my talk. This is uh, an image of the of our lab and of the SFG laser that we put together. Um, and so this took two and a half years to produce. And this was a lot of the microscopy that was done in the future that I passed on to the students who came after me. So with that, I wanna thank you very much for um, allowing me to talk today. Um, and it's a pleasure to share with you my research. Um, this project was a lot of work, but it was, um, I had a lot of success, so our family of researchers grew, 
and um, and I had a lot of fun in graduate school and um, doing research. And so if you have any questions on those topics, just let me know. Thank you very much. I especially like that one photo on the right there of all three of us. <laughs> That's uh, Dr. <laughs> Nuskoop to myself and Dr. Lee. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Lee. I appreciate it. So thank the you. one thing I just wanted, before we uh, begin our question and answer section, I just wanted to you know comment that something maybe students don't realize at this level is this sort of interdisciplinary approach that science is taking these days. So it's funny because Dr. Dasgupta and I were actually in the same research group, though she was a chemistry PhD student, I was a physics PhD student. We actually had students from material science as well in our one group. And it's this interdisciplinary approach that's driving so much of the research today. You've heard that Dr. Lee is a chemical engineer, but a large portion of his project was actually biologically determined. So it's funny how you have these collaborations because the problems are so complex, one set of, uh, I guess, knowledge centers can't answer the problem as a whole. You need to depend on other people. So I just thought that was a very interesting thing and thank you for that, Dr. Lee. So I'm gonna open up our forum today for uh, any students, specifically students, who'd like to say something or maybe they'd have a couple of questions for any of the speakers they heard today. Anyone? No, no speakers. Okay, well then I think I will ask a question. So let me ask you, Dr. Wallace, what got you interested in physics in the first place? Okay, I am, I can definitively say I'm the non-traditional physicist. I was terrible in math and science in K through eight and in high school. And I suffered from what we say in education was stereotype threat. And it was, you know, these negative images that were projected upon people of color and you started to believe them. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, got to college and majored in political science just so I could avoid math. But after two years, I realized that it was nothing that I was gonna do in political science that I truly enjoyed. But I knew I loved aviation and I knew I loved astronomy. And though they didn't have those majors at Grambling, they did have physics. And I went to the physics department and said, I'd like to major in physics. They said, well, your math background's kind of weak, but, and I said, well, I'll take whatever developmental courses I gotta take if you just give me the opportunity. And that was this long process. Um, but eventually I started to learn, I learned better when I tutored. And you learn better, you, you learn when you teach. You and teach. And I loved tutoring. And so I at least had a seed that told me why I wanted to go into, you know, possibly teaching. Although I still didn't think I was smart enough to be a professor. But then when I got to graduate school, when I was doing my research, research in plasma physics, I also tutored. And the department noticed it. And when I finished, they said, we, it's not a good thing. Uh, the, the laboratory instructor who was there for like 30 something years passed away and they needed someone very fast. And they said, Ken, would you be interested in teaching the class? And the rest is history. That makes sense to me. <laughs> so I, would, I mean, it's kind of funny you say that. I had some similar issue, I think back in elementary school and uh, I remember when they were trying to teach us how to add and subtract fractions, I'd always been very good at math up until that point. And it just didn't make any sense to me because that system was always by rote and my brain really is very structured and analytical. So it's like, if it doesn't make sense, I don't memorize steps well, but I, the concept, if it makes sense. So it's kind of those things when you finally start to feel your oats so or you get that confidence in something, it can drive you forward in such a way. So I completely agree. You're, I I, no, no, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, please, please. I, I was, you, you reminded me of a, a story that I tell all the time in that journey of becoming a physicist. And it was like what you said. I, all the way up into college, did not understand inequalities. I just saw these two little symbols and I never grasped it. Mm -hmm. Then my teacher, Miss Gamble, I'll never forget her, she looked at me and said, Mr. Wallace, all you have to do is remember that the alligator takes the biggest bite. And I just. That's a good one. And on that day was, I believe, the start. Maybe I can understand this language we call math. Yeah. So I, I, I totally get where you're coming from. No, I do. That's. <laughs> It, it, that feels, I had a very, a very similar experience too. I always sort of said, it just points to the bigger number always. The mouth opens to the bigger one. So it's the exact same thing that was told to me. <laughs> 
So uh, any other students, you know, if you want to ask any questions, you can also submit them by using either the chat feature or just please feel free to chime in at any time if you have any questions. If I have, with your permission, I'd like to poke the bear. I noticed that Driana Russell is here and she had her first research experience this summer. And huh. I, I think, I, especially considering, um, you know, uh, the, the experience we talked about with Dasgupta, I would be very interested for her to share what was her research experience like? If, if your microphone is working, Driana, would you be, be interested in sharing? If you can put it, if, you, if you're not, mic's not working, that's fine. You could put a little text in the room so everyone can read it. But uh, yeah, th that'd be fine because I realize I might have put her on the spot. Yes. Yes. This is Patricia Matthews Juarez. I would like to know uh, how Christopher Lee's experience was in terms of leading him uh, because I would like to see the, if, if there's a contrast. Uh, uh, Dr. Lee, Tell us about your your awakening to to uh, physics and and whatnot as as a child, listening to uh, Brian and uh, Brian. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I also I had a lot of doubts in myself. I didn't think that I was good at math. I actually grew up in the East Bay in California. Um, and I went to a school that was majority Asian and um, I was often put in, cl in classes where I was sort of in the middle and I had a lot of self doubt in myself that I wasn't good at math or I wasn't good at testing or I wasn't, I couldn't comprehend certain concepts. And, um, you know, I had a lot of Asian friends who did better than me and they had tutoring um, programs that they had through their um, family structures, um, which I didn't have access to. Um, I didn't initially want to do engineering. Um, I thought that, you know, it wasn't something that I would succeed at. Um, but I had a lot of influential um, mentors and teachers who um, encouraged me to, to study really hard, to, um, to go after the topics that I you know, gravitated towards that I enjoyed and enjoyed spending my time on. Um, so that's where I got a lot of my courage to, to pursue it when I went to UC Davis um, as an undergrad. Um, and there I faced a lot of difficulties. I had to um, go to tutoring programs um, when I took calculus and physics because it wasn't something that I had any exposure to when I was in high school. So that was all new to me, whereas other students had already taken physics and uh, calculus in high school. So um, I took the tutoring programs. Um, I studied really hard um, and I eventually met friends who had, were, uh, also enjoyed science. They, they had a passion for science. They enjoyed the classes and we studied together. And so that's how I sort of gravitated towards science. And then I did, as an undergrad, um, an internship in a research lab, which I worked with a lot of different graduate students. And that's how I got into um, graduate school research. Um, so it all kind of started from there, but, it, but I did have a lot of self-doubts in myself. And in graduate school, when I met um, Archie and Brian, you know, we all, often had a lot of talks about whenever things were discouraging, when we faced barriers, whether it was like with people that were frustrating to deal with, um, so having friends that um, also have those doubts and uh, share those difficulties and also the positive experiences is really meaningful to have that um, in high school and undergrad and then in graduate school and also in your career. It, it's really important. Wonderful. Thank you. Brian Cooper? So, yes. Back to you. <laughs> I just wanted to ask that question. So specifically, it was, well, you know what, just remind me exactly, so which question would you like me to answer uh, why I got interested in physics specifically? Well, the, the question was that you and Brian Kent Wallace raised an issue about how, uh, when you started looking at physics, you, you had a, a, a sort of innate um, interest but it was never really supported. And, and so uh, as two 
African American men uh, with uh, a cultural uh, background and pathway different from Dr. Lee, Christopher Lee, I wanted to uh, raise for the student that there are commonalities mm -hmm. across uh, uh, racial ethnic groups, uh, not necessarily based on race, but based on sometimes who you are, where you sit on the curve, and, and the environment that you're in. So that one can't assume that someone who looks different from you have a better experience than you, that you really have to pursue your own dream and find people within those, within the parameter in your reality that allows you to reach your dreams. And what Christopher laid out, uh, when you look at the work that the three of you are doing, based on where you thought you could not go, mm -hmm. the possibilities are open tremendously. Whether yes, or not are. you are good at what you do at the beginning, but if you get the right people working with you, you get the right environment, you're doing the right internships, you're doing, you're asking the right questions, then you can achieve anything you want to achieve. That's and that's the point, that was the point I was trying to make. Yeah, just to add to that, one of the things that I'm actually gonna be speaking again in section F, uh, and I'm just gonna address this more directly, but one of the things that's really important is engagement. Um, a lot of times, especially for students of color, as a black male, I can speak through my entire educational experience, I always felt marginalized, um, especially during graduate school, I'll get into that in a little bit. But one very positive thing that happened to me was when I was in, when I was finishing my undergraduate, you know, I told the students, you know, when I was teaching at Penn State, I told them, it's important to engage the professor for multiple reasons, because the class, if the person, you know, a lecture of a couple hundred people, and if you do not make yourself known, basically, whatever the grade tabulates, that's what you're going to get, but other considerations can be made. And that's when I figured out, you know what, if I put myself out there and show that these people, maybe I can do something to confront those implicit biases that they have about what, who or what they think that I can do. Because uh, my journey, educationally, I went to a small Irish Catholic school for elementary school in Philadelphia. And I was constantly being made to feel like I was less than. Uh, specific things, there were, and so much that it didn't even occur to me to think to go into science. My parents are in medicine, they wanted me to go into medicine too. But getting the fact that I really couldn't stand the sight of blood, that probably wasn't going to be the best career choice for me. And I realized it was very good with numbers. So eventually I did become a doctor, just not the kind my mother wanted me to be. And so it was one of those things of building that confidence and having that strong mentorship relationship with specifically an undergraduate professor who was also Chinese, uh, Dr. Lin. And it's funny, you can have these cross-cultural exchanges but you need to be open to them. You're not always going to get someone who is going to be on your side. Like yeah, Archie and Chris and I have uh, all had unique experiences in graduate school. Archie's and I were a little bit similar. There are difficulties in politics to navigate. Um, and I'm always very honest with students, with, especially with students of color and, and, and even more over with black students. You are a, you're going to be a unicorn. Uh, it's a bit of an oddity to see. I was the only black person in the entire physics department at Penn State for almost the entirety of the time I was there. There was one black professor who was there when I first went to my PhD program. He left abruptly in the middle of the second term in my first year, like just left. And I didn't understand why. Not another six months to a year after that, I certainly understood why. Because uh, things that were said to me, you know, oh, well, you got here on a quota. I said, well, not to mention I graduated summa cum laude and I got really high scores in the GRE subject exams. They didn't even want to consider, they didn't want to believe it. And I always tell people, you need to build, you know, grow a battle skin, but don't ever let anyone take you off of what your dream is. It was uh, Eleanor Roosevelt who said, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. And that is a very important, I live my life by, that's almost a mantra for me. 
because you control your future and destiny, not them. Now, they might be able to put up hurdles, but you can always get around them. And what should drive you, I always told students, is what should drive you is your love and your passion for the subject. There's going to be difficulties. That's the nature of life. But it should never stop you from pursuing your goals. Yeah. So, yeah. I was wondering about Archie. I didn't include her in, oh. in how did she, because she's the only woman and we're looking for encouraging women as well to go into engineering. Uh, just briefly, I know we're running out of time, but just briefly, uh, this has been an incredible discussion. Just what do you think about, where were you in this whole uh, discourse around how did you come into your own? Yeah, I think um, women certainly have um, some some very specific issues, um, especially because we don't see role models. As I was saying that um, when I was in my school, um, I was very lucky that I there were teachers that were female and they were very encouraging. But a lot of time from uh, my uh, the girls I I. I with me. Um, I heard from a lot of them, they're really scared of like pursuing a scientific career because it just doesn't look appealing to them for different reasons. Sometimes because um, even in my college, I heard that, that they say, oh, but the tech sector, it's so heavy. Like it, it just looks like a very, you know, male dominated sector and uh, it, we don't see women on top. And we just, till today, it's true because I, I work in one of the biggest corporations. And if I look at the leadership positions, there are, it's very rare to have a woman in a, in a leadership role, in, in a, even in a big corporation today. But I think, just as Brian said, I think if you love doing something, you have to pursue it. And maybe we will be the generation who bring the change. If we haven't seen it, maybe we can change it. That's probably the goal. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, if I may say, and to your sto to a testament to what you're saying, <clears throat> what I tell my students all the time, if they're ever discouraged because they don't see anyone that looks like them, <clears throat> at some point you just have to say this. If there has never been, then you're just going to have to be the first. Yeah. Because there is always a first, and there's yeah. no reason why you're not that person. You're absolutely, that's absolutely true. One of the things that a lot of students will sometimes struggle with. I remember when I was at Penn State, there was actually one black graduate student who came in after me and I wish the department, I was a fourth year at the time. So I wasn't always, you know, at that point, you're kind of in your own world, in your own lab, in your own experiments. Um, and I didn't even realize that this young lady, because the physics department there was huge. And I wish someone had let me know that there was another black student. It didn't even occur to them to tell me so that I could speak to her and get, but she ended up dropping out within the first year. And that was very disconcerting. And now it's one of the things that I've made my mission. I started a business a little bit ago that is the driving force of my business, Pal Cooper LLC is determined to increase the number of African-Americans and other underrepresented minorities in STEM-based fields. Because working at, for instance, when I worked at Intel for many years, uh, it was very clear that the treatment that the black engineers and some of the Latino engineers would receive was far worse than anyone else. And a lot, oftentimes for the women as well. Um, it was a very male-driven, um, usually white or Indian male driven company. And this was very uncomfortable for people who did not fit into that paradigm. Um, you were oftentimes doubted and you needed to really grow a very thick skin. And so I always tell people, you know what? Yes, I'm making money, but we can do real good here. We can actually inspire students and show them how to navigate in the hopes that in if the more, there are more and more and more black PhDs and black scientists and black engineers, these people will have more interactions and when we can change this for the better. You think of medicine, my father um, went into medical school in 77. And so in 1981, he was a black doctor in the South. Yes, there were many black doctors, but not nearly the number there are now. And it's funny how he's told me over the last 30 something years how his job has gotten easier. 
And I said, you know what, that is a model for science. If we can make that, there's more of us there. We will all have an easier time. And not to mention, you'll have more interactions. People will see that we're not that dissimilar. And hopefully we can break down some of the barriers. So that's really become a driving force for me because I've recognized that's the only way to change is exposure. So I think we have, just checking our time, we have about nine minutes before we go. Are there any other questions from the gallery? Any students who'd like to ask a question? Well, I did prepare something just on the fly here, just so we don't waste any of our time. I'm going to share my screen in a second. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. There we go. Okay. And one moment. All right. Okay, let me see. Is that present? Can you see my screen? Yes. So you see a chamber of some kind, I'm assuming? Now we see, now we see your uh, email. Oh, <laughs> that's weird. Sorry. What about now? We yeah. see that. Uh, the okay. Email. Awesome. So one thing here, I'm just going to go over what this was here. So this was a project while I was at Brookhaven National Laboratory. Uh, I got a taste for what it was like to work independently in research for the first time. I've been working uh, as an undergraduate researcher in a physics lab at my home institution, which was Temple, but I had no say over the work's progression. Obviously, I was an undergrad. I didn't have enough experience. But in that internship at Brookhaven, the first day, they handed me this very large metal tube, which you see is that primary structure there, with these nipples jutting out of it. Uh, we usually equally space, and they asked me to build a thermal evaporator chamber using this metal object. Uh, I had no idea what the, uh, the thermal evaporator even was. They said, you had a $10,000 budget. And I said, well, I was an undergraduate student, and it was my first internship at a national lab. I'm like, $10,000, my goodness, my jaw dropped. I actually got a little scared and because I had no idea what a thermal evaporator, what it even was. So I thought, okay, they're going to give me $10,000 to build something that might not work. And for a moment, I thought my career as a physicist would be over before it even started. So just to tell you really quickly, a thermal evaporator is a chamber that is used to vaporize metals by running an enormous current through a highly resistive material in which your source sits. So usually your source is like a noble metal, like gold or a platinum, um, and you literally send up the gold in smoke. So while the, madam, the atoms are in a, a gaseous state, they'll fill the chamber, and then they absorb to the surface. So if your surface is cooled, then they will re-solidify. And these machines, they're ubiquitous in solid state physics labs or chemistry labs, um, that anything that works with the material that you want to perform an electrical measurement on. So the best way to understand that purpose of doing this is to envision an electrical outlet in your wall. And you plug in a fan, say. That fan is your device. And the wall outlet is the contact to the current source. So the metal you deposit on the surface of your sample it's like a, it's, you know, sorry, the sample is the contact point between the device. So if you wish to measure and the machine which you're using, you measure the, uh, oh, sorry, I lost my place here because I'm trying to do this. That's what I wanted to do. Oh, where did it go? There. So inside of this chamber, you're going to see all these parts. Everything in here was either salvaged from some machine that had already existed or I had to fashion it. So you're gonna look here, you're gonna see this piping. This had to be brazed. This shutter valve here, I found the valve in some older machine, but this had to be constructed here. And it was a really interesting project. So as I always tell the students, I said, embrace your tinkerer spirit. And so I didn't know what I was doing. I just started with a Google search, got my components list, but when you're doing these things, and this was that an internship, which is a very similar thing to an REU, it gives you an under the hood look at what it is to work as a real scientist. So just a few to share a few other pictures with you. That is the result. This here is one of the samples I was working in a high temperature superconductivity lab. 
And so this was a high temperature uh, superconducting film of uh, lanthanum strontium cuprate. And this gold here is the contact pattern that I've made with the machine that I've built, which is this guy here. This is the molecular beam epitaxy chamber, which was the principal device used for growing these crystals here. This was the chamber. So all of this is hand, hand designed and hand constructed. This is the chamber that I designed and built as an undergrad. And my point is when you work in these kinds of things, it gives you the confidence and the understanding to know. So hopefully students will go to the professors and ask them, hey, is there something that I can do to start research? Because that will actually fuel and drive your passion for the subject matter. So I hope that helped someone. I think we are just about at our time. I think we have three or four minutes left. Anyone else like to ask a question of any of our speakers today? No? Okay, well, I have three minutes to it. So I'm gonna ask a question. Dr. Dasgupta, will you tell me when you were at, in graduate school versus in your, uh, versus in your career, when you were the only female, say, at a conference, how would you have any words of advice to any female students who are interested in going into careers in science or in engineering, what they can do to sort of prepare themselves and how to deal with that situation to make the most positive effect? Yeah, so um, I think my day-to-day -day work, I do a lot of um, meetings, as you know, um, that's how it works in the corporations. Um, most of the meetings, I'm the only female. Uh, those meetings are usually of like 10 people capacity, I would say nine or 10 people. And usually I'm the only woman. That's, that has been the case for last three years. So I don't see it changing anytime soon either. Um, I think, I think first of all, you need to be aware of it. Um, because, um, if I talk to my male colleagues about this, some of them don't even notice how, um, you know, there can, can be a culture that can be a little bit um, like um, not aware of the fact, especially for women, I would say, um, don't let anybody interrupt you because that's something that happens, um, whether knowingly, unknowingly, people do that. And you have to set some boundaries. Um, or if you have, you know, if you think you are being questioned more than others, you have to kind of step your foot in and make your place, basically. Yes, That's you do. All I yeah. Well, I think that wraps up our session for today. Thank you for everyone in participating. I hope that it was informative and enjoyable for all of you. Um, just one more shout out. If there are any other questions or anyone wants to make any lasting comments, perhaps Dr. Hentz or Dr. Juarez, which Betsy Suarez, would you like to say something just in conclusion? I would like to uh, offer uh, my congratulations to this uh, team. It's, it's Stella. Uh, we are so excited uh, to have had this session. It's really exactly what we wanted and, and I hope exactly what the student wanted uh, mm -hmm. and needed to, uh, as they formulate their plan for success and careers in engineering. And Dr. Hintz, do you want to say uh, one or two words before uh, Brian ra wraps it up. You're on mute, probably. Okay. Yes, you're on mute. On mute. Hit your space bar. There you go. Okay. There you go. Okay. I want to say I think this was a fantastic session. All of the sessions have been really wonderful. It's been professional development for me, I'm sure for other faculty and students as well. One thing I hope that all the students are taking away is that your pathway to STEM success does not have to be straightforward. It's yes, not yeah. unusual for someone to major in, to say I want to major in chemistry and change their major to biology, to change it to engineering. It's not unusual to start off in political science and move into the sciences. It's not unusual. And you have the best opportunity because you have social media and internet at your feet. So if you have a teacher that you can't understand uh, when they explain the math to you, the science to you, 
You have the internet, you have Khan Academy, you have Shams Outlines, you have other students at other universities that can help you. Physics is physics at all institutions. Yes, so if someone is taking that class somewhere else, they can help you. Mentors are mentors everywhere. So don't feel like your mentor only has to be at your institution, that you've already met your mentor. You can have virtual mentors. And I really hope that this particular conference has helped you to see a broader view of yourself in the STEM arena. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you, me. Dr. Hintz. That was wonderful. Thank you again, Dr. Matthew Juarez. This was wonderful. Thank you for the opportunity. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.